thank you so much for inviting me, by the way. I'm, I'm super excited to read. Uh, I didn't rehearse or anything, so what I'm going to do is set a little timer for 10 minutes. I'm going to read for 10 minutes, and then I'll stop for questions. So this is from The Apple Tree Throne, which I published in uh, myself in 2018, kind of a little vanity project, and um, just based on a pop song. And the idea just came out and was written very, very quickly. And I've been really gratified at people's responses to it. It seems like it connected with a lot of people. So thank you so much for inviting me to read today. So I'm starting at the scene where um, Braddock has survived the initial uh, dinner party and has been invited to move into the guest house at the Heights. And uh, said yes because he didn't feel like he could say no. So I live in the Heights now, like a proper gentleman, and Clarkie and his wife Victoria helped me move my pitiful few possessions into the guest house. My things lurk quite ashamed of their provenance among the grand furnishings, like a cockroach on the wallpaper trying desperately to blend into the pattern. The Wickersleys have transported most of the personal items out of the place for which I find myself superstitiously and enormously relieved. But as we walk through the rooms, marveling at the delicacy of the furniture and the fittings, I cannot help but feel a bit like a commoner usurping a royal throne. Here, this was his chaise long upon whose green velvet his long elegant body has left a long elegant dent. This was his bed, whose mattress Vic insists upon flipping, then replacing the linens so they no longer smell of him. This was his writing desk, emptied of all his effects and still bearing a lighter spot on the mahogany where his wrist would have rested to work. You can get that right out with a raw walnut, Vic says confidently and makes a note in her pocketbook. His wardrobe is blessedly empty, smelling of cedar rounds, and we hang my musical clothing inside, the threadbare civvies next to the crisp new uniforms. I am relieved when we shut and lock the door. It brings down the image of the place. There, you've gone up in the world, Clark says, after we finish and have installed ourselves in the empty kitchen for the servants will not start till tomorrow. No eating doves and lizards anymore, my lad. Oh dear, I do hope you haven't told your young lady those stories, I tell him, as Vic rolls her eyes at us. With the greatest relish, he announces. Indeed, a bit of relish would have gone down nicely with our vittles, eh, Braddock? I smile weakly. Near the end, we had all grown so hungry from the regular but mean rations that some men had resorted to trapping local birds. For a share of the stew, I plucked and dressed them as the only man Jack among them that had done it as a lad. I loathe the gamey flavor of those verminous pigeons and crows, but ate all the same. We ate horse, too, whenever one went down and could not be saved. The Frenchmen and Goths who ate it at home never complained, and Clark told me he once saw one of them hamstringing a horse in the night to improve the next day's rations. That was officially sabotage, and he could have been shot, but we were all too tired to care by that point. Which reminds me, Wickersley never ate that stuff, I say. He holed up in his tent and crunched up on a hardtack like a very Ahab. And he used to dress us down for joking about nibbles, remember? You're right, he did, Clark cries. Probably because he's done his share of it before we went overseas. You know how those career army types are. Clarify for me, gentlemen, Vic says. Who was Nibbles? Oh, uh, that was the nickname for one of the older lads in our division, I tell her. Short for Cam Nibble, as he used to be a Navy man and he almost definitely at people at sea, and that's why he requested a transfer to the Army, Clark says. And Wickersley never laughed because he, pff, why undeniably, a sure sign of an anthropophage if ever I heard one, I say, shaking my head. You too, Vic says affectionately, are disgusting. Strange meat indeed, how can you speak so ill of the dead? And we laugh uncomfortably because she is well aware that we loved him, but she was not there in the battlefield with us where all we could do was speak ill of each other to survive. Laughter was better than bread, we used to say, 
it could be shared infinitely amongst the squad and it did not have weevils in it. But it seems less funny now. At dusk, I strolled the grounds around my new domicile. The thick green turf not yet tipped with frost, the black iron gates wickedly spiked, fresh glass on the garden walls. I cannot shake the feeling that I am staying at a hotel and will soon be ejected for failure to pay. I too clearly remember the hungry year before the draft when it seemed that I never ran but for being chased, when the crafty childish joy of scraping a living and priding myself on my resourcefulness ran out and it was all stomach music and unshaven cheeks when I thought I might have to become a sandwich man to survive, mocked by all. Wickersley, who disdained the various ways we stretched our army grub, had never felt that, but I find I cannot begrudge him this. His family are good people, and their good deed will preserve what is left of my safe pay packets, uh, like the ant in the story preparing for winter. I have never been quite comfortable being a grasshopper. A deepening lilac sky burns above the gray stone of the walls, stars glinting in mimicry of the glass topped bricks. Here in the lawn, I can barely see the electric streetlights of the town. I'm sure I can see them from my room though, and this turns out to be true. He does not come the first night, nor the second. The third, I awaken at the tapping, assume I am dreaming, and return to bed. On the seventh night, we stare at each other for minute after minute. And I finally go and light a candle and bring it back to the window. I hope to discover that it is some um, optical illusion caused by a trick of the curtains on the glass, but he is still there. The torn throat where Captain Eleutherios's great curved knife emptied out his life. The London smoky khakis soaked in darkness from neck to knee his face twisted in pain and fear. I can see through him to both moon and stars. Well, if I am not asleep and am not mad, then this is indeed a spiritual visitation and I suppose he's not unjustified as I've had the audacity to move in here in the first place and in the second have had dinner once more with Miss Myers since then. It is not, I wish to reassure him, that I am trying to, or would even like to take his place. His place is his place. I am trying to make one of my own, slowly and with difficulty, because I am tired all the time, I hurt all the time. There is no place I can make my own, not right now. But none of this is said. His ghostly hand extends and the knuckle meets the glass with the faintest of tapping sounds. There is a wide smear of transparent blood on the back of his hand, perhaps where he brought it up in a futile attempt to forestall the bite of the blade. And yet, to be brutally precise, having one's throat cut is a wartime death for which many of those now dead would fervently pray. There are many, many worse fates. The men he led into the retreat would have begged for a slit throat, and perhaps some of them did. I am sorry, sir, I murmur, and pull the curtains shut. Okay, that wasn't quite 10 minutes, but that seemed like a good place to stop. <laughs> Thank you.